Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Welcome to Bitcoin 101, new YouTube exclusive course where I'll be answering some of your most frequently asked questions about the subject. So join me. Welcome back. So in this course, we are looking at a Bitcoin. What is the Bitcoin? Why do we need it? What function or problem does it solve in our society? So let's start. So if you have a look at every economic system, you will see, just like those of you who study uh, Sharia or Islamic finance, you will understand that uh, one of the core aims of Sharia is to preserve wealth, whether that is individual wealth, how we contract, how we engage with others, or as a system, economic or financial system. So that every system will aim to preserve integrity and trust in the money as a key building block of that system. Now, that brings us to digital currencies that we see very popular these days. When Satoshi Nakamoto designed peer-to-peer -peer electronic currency, Bitcoin, he saw a particular problem, and that is that trust in order to facilitate for the payment is basically in the hands of financial institutions. So what he wanted to do is distribute the trust to the people and away from financial organizations like a bank and so on. So basically, if we have a look at uh, our everyday commerce transaction, you might have a two people. Let's say you have a two people, person A and B. So normally when you have very simple, straightforward transaction like this. If you have a cash, you can just give. Person gives to another person directly. There is no need for anybody else because that physical item exists only in one space. Now, when you are dealing with digital currency, let's say you are doing online shopping, this transaction needs to be verified by third person. So that's why we have banks. Banks here act as an intermediary, third party, to ensure that there is a trust. So what would bank do? Bank would verify that I have $10 in my account. And if I'm sending, let's say, $2 to this person, bank would make sure that now we record this, that this person would get 2 plus 5, which is $7. And now I would have minus 2, which is $8 in my account. So Satoshi saw that this involvement of financial institution is a problem. And so he wanted to take away the power, this overreaching, overarching view, dependency on financial institution, and give it back into the hands of people so that they don't have to be dependent on these institutions. And we'll see later on what is the problem that he saw in some of these institutions. So, issue that he had with all of this is depending and trust on the financial institution and any other banks, Visa, PayPal, all of these organizations. Now, the problem when we deal with digital currency of any kind is that digital currency is just like a file. And we all know files. You can copy them. If you have a PDF file, you can email it to 100 people. All of us have the same file. So how do you create digital currency that when you move from one person to another, the original copy is not there anymore, so that you ensure that the only one copy remains. This is the problem that is known as a double spending. And without trusted third parties, Satoshi thought of a system, which he discussed in his white paper, which is a form of electronic cash payment, where you have peer-to-peer -peer transaction without financial intermediary or a third party. The way he thought about it is he distributed the trust across participants in that uh, payment network. And those participants now, instead of financial institution, they verify all of these transactions are taking place, how much each person have in their wallet. So what he has done, he has created a system where you have a timestamp 
on every transaction. So when you pay somebody $2, that transaction is time stamped and put into a block, what we call a block. So that block is now proof and it is in the chronological order when the payment was made. So if somebody wanted to spend the same money later on and put it in the next block, then the first block would have all of the transactions that happened and when verification is done, it would alert that you do not have that much money. So in a simple way, he has invented a way of tracking payments through the use of timestamps and distributed a need for one particular party. And he outsourced this to the collective group of participants in that network. So let's see a little bit more about this. This all started, the birth of Bitcoin started in January 2009. And I think most of us know what happened in that period. We had a major global financial crisis, uh, banks, uh, regulations, uh, uh, everything was upside down. Satoshi minted the first, what is called Genesis, a block, block zero with a very interesting message. He quoted the Times newspaper, 3rd January 2009, quote, which says, Chancellor on a brink of second bailout for banks. Now, we all know what happened in the global financial crisis. Banks were seen as too big. They wanted to have no regulations, but once they were about to collapse, they asked for all of the stimulus and they were bailed out. Who bailed them out? Average people. People like you and me, we had to dig in our pockets and through our taxes pay money to the government so that government can give money to those banks who didn't want to be regulated. As some of the people said before, these banks, they are socialist when it comes to diversifying and spreading the risk and losses to everybody. But they are capitalist when it comes to putting uh, all of the money in their own pocket. So he, Satoshi saw this as fundamentally corrupt behavior, which the whole piece, whole text, tells us a little bit about his motivation and dissatisfaction with the current financial system and why he was motivated to come up with a better alternative. So what is the Bitcoin? Bitcoin is not a coin. You often see it, uh, little gold coins and all of these things. It's a digital file, just like you have on your USB or on a mobile phone. It's an open ledger. It's, a, it's a just a file like any other file. That is a collection of these transactions in the ledger, as we said before. What is the blockchain? Blockchain is just technology that moves Bitcoin from one person to another. It's a not a Bitcoin itself, okay? So all of these transactions are stored in these blocks, and that's how we timestamp and know what is happening and when. What this allows, allows us to have electronic version of cash that people can pay without worry that we will be in a situation where somebody could double spend. Okay, at least that is the idea. Now, when it comes to day-to-day -day commerce, let's summarize what are the, some of the key issues that Satoshi saw as a reason for coming up with a new decentralized currency? So he saw whenever you go to the store to buy something electronically or online, he saw the impediment as a third party, that financial organization, to smooth and efficient operations and payment system. So he had a couple of uh, points which he raised in his white paper. One of these is that when we are buying and selling commerce and on the internet specifically, we rely on trusted third parties to process payment. And he saw a problem that these transactions are reversible. So he gave an example, for, exa for instance, if you sell, send someone package, you cannot reverse that package. Yet, person who paid for the package could ring a bank or something like that, and they could reverse the payment. So you have a problem. 
Now, because of this problem, you come to all kind of uh, disputes that could arise. That is how he saw this process. And he said that this limited, this uh, uh, reversibility of uh, current uh, payment method, this limited minimum practical transaction size. And then that has a result of cutting off the possibility of small casual transactions. So we see what he really wanted here was uh, that you could have these small transactions, especially in certain countries where uh, they, 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 you don't want to pay huge fees, people want to send a few dollars here or there, and you don't want to be eaten by all of these fees and slow transactions. So he saw this as a day-to-day -day, uh, payment network that helps people uh, in terms of these practical, small, casual transactions. On the other hand, he saw that government regulations that allow for certain things to happen in terms of those uh, banks that we have seen on Wall Street, that allow them to package those derivatives, sell them to the people, gamble, bet, take short position and insurances, and then when everything else collapses, they get bailouts, they get insurance and everything. He saw all of these as very, very corrupt, corrupt issue. Money supply by central banks and what it does to our money, inflation. And who, everybody knows that uh, most of the central banks today, they are not trying with their inflationary policy. They are not trying to keep money as it is. But the target inflation is usually 2, 3 or more percent, which means it's a way of taking money that is in the circulation, it's polluting, diluting that money, taking basically money from your pocket, little by little. That's what inflation is. And also systemic corruption, government, banks. You don't know anymore who is working for who and is a bank uh, more in charge of our economy or is it the government? And so we see that most of the government regulation and decisions are highly correlated with what financial industry wants and not necessarily what average person wants to see. That is, that is a very strong point here. Now, this is not to say to make it into a conspiracy theory that uh, everything is just for the banks. Obviously, a lot of people are working very hard to make sure that the overall economy runs smoothly and everybody of us benefit from that. But... To say that there are no major problems here would be understatement. So now, what is driving price growth? We have seen massive growth. Everybody is tweeting uh, little rockets. Every, every coin is going uh, quadrupling. Some of the coins go thousands of percent. Are we witnessing some sort of a bubble? Is this a revolutionizing change in how we do our commerce? It all depends on how we understand what is going on. And that will this be decided by the expectations that we have. And those expectations are long versus short-term expectations. So investors will have different expectations. Miners, those who process these and verify these transactions. Users, different sort of platforms will have their own expectations. And so what we need to ask ourselves is, What's in it for me? This is what everybody is asking. Investor is asking, what's in it for me? Platform, what's in it for me? So everybody is thinking, what's in it for me short versus long term? And based on these decisions, people are choosing to hold the currency, to buy, to invest, to sell. This will all be very much decided on how we see Bitcoin to be functional currency, to be stable store of value, and all the other things that Satoshi mentioned. I hope you enjoyed this first episode. Please subscribe, share this, and come back for more next time. Salam alaikum.